Why do investors behave as they do? Well, investor behavior often deviates from logic and reason, emotional processes, mental mistakes, and individual personality traits complicate investment decisions. Here to talk with us about that is Victor Riccardi. He is a professor of financial management at uh, Goucher College in Baltimore, Maryland. Victor, welcome to the Index Investing Show. Nice to have you with us. Oh, thank you for having me. I always enjoy talking about investor behavior and behavioral finance. So give us just a quick uh, 411 on that and the background of the idea behind behavioral finance. What is it? Um, behavioral finance deals with integrating psychology and finance. Um, uh, s- some of the initial experiments that came over from psychology uh, were applied by a small group of uh, finance professors uh, 15, 20 years ago. And with the financial crisis, many of these issues came to light. Uh, so, for, for instance, people tend to make decisions based on loss aversion, meaning um, losses feel twice as painful as, a, as an equivalent gain. Another aspect of behavioral finance is people tend to be overconfident in their skills, especially when the market is going up. They attribute that to their investment expertise. And another important aspect is people use something called heuristics, in which they make rules of thumb or decisions based on a cognitive process when they're faced with uh, a large amount of information. However, sometimes those heuristics don't necessarily lead to making better decisions. If you're just joining us, you're listening to the Index Investing Show. We're pleased to be talking with Victor Riccardi. He's the author of a brand new book titled Investor Behavior, The Psychology of Financial Planning and Investing. Now, one of the other common traits, especially among mutual fund investors, is the chase past performance uh, thing that they do. They like to buy the best performing funds historically. So what does this research Tell us about the problems with this kind of defective approach to investing. Uh, Well, the book shows, for example, there's a chapter that deals with um, mutual fund advertising uh, by companies. And um, since there's really no absolute standard, many times uh, investment companies only provide people with, say, the next, the best returns. Those could be three-year returns, five-year returns. Um, So they focus on, or they anchor on, a very small. Um, set uh, of returns, so that makes them heard and follow those returns. Another aspect of it is many people uh, suffer from uh, optimism bias in which they expect those returns to uh, continue into the uh, foreseeable future, say, for another year or two. Now, I want to talk with something about uh, the battle of the sexes because there are some very big differences between the way men invest and the way women invest. Which gender is the better investor, male or female? Well, unfortunately for the the men, they should learn to say yes to you and let the women do the investing because a classic or seminal uh, research study by Odin and Barber looked at 35,000 accounts in... um, uh, in about 10, 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, and they had they had uh, about six years' worth of data. They compared men and women within that uh, portfolio of 35,000 accounts, and their hypothesis was that men are overconfident. They tend to trade too much. Um, therefore, they, they incur larger trading costs, and that has a negative uh, net effect on their overall returns. And because women are more analytical, they are investors, and they don't trade as much, um, they wind up getting higher returns, about 1% more per year for that six years of of data that was in that study. So, so, sorry, guys. (laughs) I knew it! The the ladies were better investors than the guys. Now, I will say that if there's one Achilles heel uh, for the women... It'll be that their portfolios, at least from what I've seen when we do our portfolio report cards on this program, the women's portfolios tend to be more conservatively oriented uh, as opposed to the men's, which are more aggressive. But don't you think that could also pose a problem for women because of just the fact that they've got a longer lifespan? Uh, At least that's what the mortality tables tell us. Women live longer. And if they've got more conservative portfolios, I mean, isn't there a risk of them outliving potentially their assets? 
Um, I think that's a potential problem, but, but I also think both sexes probably suffer from, if they don't necessarily suffer from just overconfidence behavior, uh, that's one subset. Uh, uh, many people, say, for retirement funds, suffer from essentially what's known as um, status quo bias, meaning they fail to even rebalance their portfolio. So if, if women tend to be too conservative and lead too much in bonds, in a down market, I think the rebalancing aspect, if that's applied, would help them maybe put them in more aggressive funds in times when the market is, is going down, for example. If you're just joining us, we're pleased to be talking with Victor Riccardi. Um, he, he's uh, the author of a book called Investor Behavior, The Psychology of Financial Planning and Investing. It's a new book. It's available at Amazon.com. Go pick up a copy. Now, one of the problems that I see, Victor, all the time are people with an inappropriate mix of investments. For example, a 60-year-olds with the asset mix of a teenager They've got maybe 95% of their portfolio in stocks. Conversely, a 25-year-old person with the asset mix or asset allocation of an 85-year-old person, maybe they've got 90% of their money in cash. So what is the genesis or problem behind poorly constructed portfolios? Well, um, I think many people just under-diversify because they don't even understand the different types of mutual funds. But one aspect could be that uh, certain people have a tendency to only invest in what would be familiarity bias, meaning that we overweight in companies or mutual funds or countries or, or markets in which we're only familiar with. Um, basic research shows uh, that typically the average investor only puts about 5% or less of their money in um, overseas-type funds. So that's part of the lack of uh, diversification. Um, another piece is, again, back to that overconfidence behavior where people are just, whether they're old or younger, may put or concentrate their assets in too broad of an asset class. Now, what about an individual's investor personality type something that is unique to them, something that identifies them kind of like a fingerprint or maybe DNA. It explains their characteristics, their strengths, their weaknesses. How important do you think is it that people identify their personality types before investing? I think it's very important. Um, and a, a very uh, a central aspect is how people perceive the aspect of control in their life. If they have a personality where they're very controlling, many times they won't listen to a financial planner. Many times they may suffer from something like illusion of control in which they, can, they think they can invest in something and somehow control um, the outcome of their investments. Um, but that gets into a, there, there are a, a wider range of uh, personality types, and there's a chapter in the book that discusses that, so it's something I would encourage people to really look into. But it, it gets, it gets uh, very complex. What about risk? Do you think people, after what we've been through here with the 2000 uh, stock market crash, especially with the Internet, uh, Internet stocks melting down, and then, of course, in 2008 with the financial crisis, do you think people today have a better understanding of financial risk than before? Well, I mean, they remember it because it's, it's, they, they suffer from, it. I think I mentioned before, the anchoring bias. So many people are anchoring now on the financial crisis even from five years ago. The, un, the unfortunate thing is now they're too concerned with risk, and that winds up uh, inhibiting them from having anything in stocks. If you take basic, or you look at some basic public surveys of people who, who had in the past invested in, in, in the market, um, a high percentage of those people are, are not even putting more money in stocks at all, whether in mutual funds or in individual stocks currently, because they're still uh, suffering from the trauma of that event. Now, what about the stock market itself, Victor? Would it be correct to say that stock prices are shaped by a certain mood or certain psychology that's reflective of its participants? Would that be a fair assessment? I would definitely say so, especially when, depending on the market cycle, or it seems like more and more recently, in recent history, say the last 20 to 25 years, we we, be, we keep on getting ourselves into bigger and bigger bubbles, and then the bubble, the, the bursting of the bubble, has then created an even worse um, outcome, unfortunately. 
What about an investor's experience? You know, I want to clarify this because this is very important. Just because an investor or a person has experience or many years at investing, or maybe they're even a professional investor, a professional portfolio manager or trader, they are still susceptible to some of the mental mistakes as the rest of us. Would that be fair to say? Uh, yes. In fact, there's even a, a paper or several papers out by an author named Nagel um, that shows that they uh, make the case for uh, the number of shocks or economic shocks or financial uh, uh, disruptions in the economy. They make the case uh, has the um, effect on creating long-term risk aversion within a generation. So it's, I think it's called the uh, collective memory hypothesis, where people focus on that memory because what winds up happening is those financial shocks impact them. So very similar, very similar to the idea of the uh, depression babies that were impacted by the uh, the, the 1930s uh, depression. Uh, it will be interesting to see what happens with Generation Y if they wind up re re repeating because of the Great Recession, the same type of behavior. And, of course, that, again, extends to the entire generation. It takes into account all of the participants that, uh, or, or, or people that are living within that generation, regardless of whether yeah. they have experience or, very, or they're rookies when it comes to investing. So these are important lessons that uh, are all contained in, in uh, Victor Riccardi's brand new book, Investor Behavior, The Psychology of Financial Planning and Investing. It's available at Amazon.com. I encourage you to check it out. And you've written an outstanding book that I think can help all of us to become uh, and behave uh, in a way that uh, can help us succeed with our investments. Thanks again, Victor, for joining us, and we hope to catch up with you soon. Thank you for having me. And my co-editor of the book is Ken Baker, and he's a great person to work with. I just wanted to make sure he got a plug. Very good. I'm Ron DeLegge. This is the Index Investing Show. Thanks for listening. And you can catch our weekly podcast. Just go to indexshow.com forward slash podcast. The Index Investing Show with Ron DeLegge.